had no idea the impact and the significance of words until I was in the 10th grade. I dared my sister, who was in eighth grade, to run for queen of the middle school. I did it as a joke. I never thought that she would listen, that she would in fact take my direction. So I found out after not only did she run, but she won, that I was successful by accident. What would happen if I used my words on purpose? It's in that moment that the direction and the course of my language began to change. I knew I had a very special connection with God when I was a freshman in college. I didn't have money to go home for the holidays and there were a group of guys who I went to school with who were headed in my direction. I asked them because I didn't have money for a plane ticket, could I get a ride home? They said absolutely no problem. The day that we were to depart, I got to the car with my duffel bag in tow. There was somebody else who was a passenger who I didn't recognize. He said, this guy cannot get in the car with us. I looked at the other guys I knew. I said, what in the world is happening? I said, sorry, Jamal, can't make it. I was stuck on that campus that Thanksgiving, frustrated, angry. Everybody else came back the Monday after Thanksgiving with stories about seeing family and friends. And I was brooding in hostility, mad because I couldn't go. Tuesday morning, there was an emergency chapel session at the college. They called us all to uh, come in, to which they made the announcement. The guys in whom I had intended on riding home with got arrested, found a kilo of cocaine in their trunk, unbeknownst to me, and they were forced to face the mandatory minimum of five years. Had I been in the car, my entire life would have changed. It became evident and pronounced that God had a plan for my life. I uh, grew up in a uh, modestly middle-class family. My mother, however, comes from the projects of New York. Every time that uh, we had a vacation, whether it's spring break or summer, she would send me to go live with my grandmother in the projects to keep me humble and to keep me grounded. The turning point in my life was uh, my 11th grade year of high school. When it is on Christmas morning, it's the only Christmas I can remember where my parents gave me literally everything that I asked for. They told us to go get dressed, take a shower. We were going on a trip and I complied. Little did I know that the trip we were going on was to go visit the poorest nation in the world, Haiti. We got to the hotel, open up my suitcase. I'm looking to see all of my clothes, but rather and instead, I found all of my Christmas presents. My parents then urged me to give my Christmas gifts away to young people who were my age, but were far from fortunate to receive the access to the things that I had. It helped me to never become wedded to material things and to never take anything for granted. From that moment to this, I am intentional of always reaching back to pull people forward. Uh, number one, never allow style to outweigh substance. So many people get caught up in the wrapping paper that they never see the gift. The second thing that uh, I would say to every writer and speaker is to make sure you bleed on the pages or on the microphone. That your listener, your viewer, your hearer has a sense of what it is that you have overcome. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a great American president, said if you want to see a great success, look for a great failure. Because anybody who failed at something can become great at anything. Uh, the Big Idea is a book about uh, always thinking beyond your own capacity. Understanding that there is a life in a world much larger than who it is that you are. We grew up with uh, the Benjamin Franklin axiom 
don't get too big for your britches. But in our generation, we realize that it ought to always be two sizes too big so you can grow into it. Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, the former president of Morehouse College, said this for 27 years to incoming freshmen. There's a crown above your head that you have to grow tall enough to wear. The black church has always been steeped in uh, the fight for what America boasts to have, liberty and justice for all. And so I find myself following in that preaching tradition, understanding that the echo of my convictions cannot l be left in the sanctuary, but have to be heard on a street corner. And so I've committed my life to making sure uh, that my actions always speak louder than my words. America is in crisis, as is the world. Many people call it COVID-19, but I call it COVID-1619, uh, because we're seeing racism today as it was then. Presently, we're seeing clips on the news of African Americans being killed by those who are deputized to protect and serve. We're seeing that 83% of black businesses are going to fail this year because of failure of support, not because of failure or inferior product. You're seeing young people who are forced to do distant learning and nobody is raising the question, do they have access to Wi-Fi or to computer services? There's a disproportionate number of African Americans who are dying of COVID-19, but nobody is seeing the trail because of pre-existing conditions. And so there is in fact a grave imbalance. And if Lady Liberty is in fact blindfolded, she must be peeking through that veil to see that there is in fact a gaping hole between the poor and the rich. I've had so many people who have come into my life at strategic and significant times to pour into me what I needed for that season. Sometimes the mentors that you have are not people you can touch or have lunch with, but they are what I affectionately call remote control mentors. People that you see from afar, but you study up close. I am a pastor, but I look at the life of Sean P. Diddy Combs, who every four years does something significant to change not only his brand, his monocler, but also his stream of income. So every time he makes a shift, I am intentional to do the exact same. America claims that you have the right to pursue happiness. I don't think that we ever succeed until we're done. Every time you reach a goal, you have to then sit up in your mind what is the next one so that you don't become complacent. I'm grateful of how it is that God has charted the course of my life. Never thought that I would be here pastoring one of America's largest churches. And now I've got another benchmark, how to be successful when church is virtual. It's an exciting path an exciting change. If I could speak for one person, I would love the privilege to speak uh, in the presence of former President Barack Obama, a considered uh, this generation's greatest orator who has uh, spoken with clarity and conviction. Uh, I would be honored, humbled, and horrified at the same time at that opportunity. If I were to speak to Barack Obama, I would uh, recount the story of Saul's transformation to Paul. He had once been known for demonizing Christians, uh, for bullying them, any short of word, and God changed his name. We have uh, so many examples of how uh, Abraham uh, went from being Abram to Abraham. And one of the significant things that Barack Obama did is that in his pursuit to meet his goal, his advisors and those who uh, worked in PR firms told him to change his name. That it was uh, while we were in the middle of tremendous conflict with the Middle East and the name Barack would be a stumbling block to his goals. But he held fast 
to what his name was and refused to shift even when it was unpopular. Fannie Lou Hamer said, it's not what they call you, it's what you answer to. Martin Luther King Jr. in his last speech in Memphis, Tennessee, I said, like anybody, I want to live a long life. But don't tell anybody about the degrees that I have, about the awards that I've won. Just tell them I've tried to help somebody. And while it is that I was never alive during the life of Dr. King, that line of his speech still rings true for me, that I want the final epithet of my life to ring clear that all I did was try to help somebody. If I could go back in time and find the Back to the Future car from McLaren, I would in fact say to myself, my only enemy is me. If I could win the war within myself of lapse of discipline and discernment, there'd be nothing that would be able to stop me. I have never experienced virtual reality. COVID-19 has been a crash course of technology for me. Uh, I thought that I was familiar with it, but really all I was doing was updating my social media profile and sending emails. And so this partnership with VR Loop has in fact catapulted me into the 21st century. And I feel like I am not Dr. Bryant, I'm Dr. Spock. I would love to see on the VR Loop platform things that will engage a generation that is only using technology for entertainment, uh, for empowerment and the equipping. Uh, the hardest task is to get young people involved uh, in uh, vehicles and streams that will better them and not deplete them. And so what VR Lou is offering, I think is gonna be a game changer, especially in the backdrop of so many students now being forced into virtual learning. Uh, this will give us another aspect and another option. Filming the VR Lou experience was somewhere between doing a movie and a National Geographic documentary. There's moments where it was fast, other moments where it was slow, but we got it done. It is uh, really the push and the pull from acting and presenting. It is the push and the struggle of being on stage, but also being authentic. I enjoyed it, but it wore me down. After this, I'm going to take a nap. I hope every person that watches me on VR Lou will say that my idea is not big enough. I've got a dream so big that it scares me and I'm embarrassed to even talk about it.